Hey, howdy, hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Greetings, cretins. We're back, we're back again. <laughs> it seemed like ages ago that we were we were doing this, uh, yeah. but you know, here we are. Uh, you know, uh, who's it? All seems like ages ago. It all seems like ages ago. <laughs> my my ability to speak clearly and think clearly and be on point seems like ages ago I was able to do that. Now, now I am just a, a withered old uh, husk, husk, uh, a mere mere shadow of, of who I used to be. Yeah, it's probably due to the vaccine <laughs> shot you got, right? <laughs> yes, and maybe all the other drugs I'm on. I think that, yeah. that, has, that has something to do with it. That, you know, the beer, the, the distillery i mean all these things they take a toll they take a toll on you young man just keep that in mind just i will in mind. i got um, my shot last week yes. my first one yep oh, good for you and, and uh do, what, what did what did you get are you pfizer moderna moderna actually yes yes uh, see we're, mm-hmm. we're moderna we're vaccine yeah. brothers yeah. And, and we're both we're both moderna yeah my shoulder kind of seized up a week later but i think that was due to a spider bite in my welding uh jacket (laughs) that sounds pretty much par for the course for for you i mean you probably picked up a similar bite in the brewery somewhere in the distillery area yeah i was i was actually fine um first first uh, shot i I felt like I was sort of getting a headache later that night, felt a little warm and that was it. And, and then the second dose, uh, my arm was a little bit sore, but not as sore as the first time. And neither one really bothered me. I was fine. That's uh, good. I haven't, I haven't heard, uh, and my kids have gotten that too, the vaccines and places. No, no real problems. Um, it felt a little flu like at a point, but, that's been it. So, uh, everyone I know, been fine. Get your get your vaccine, people. Go on and get your vaccine. It's it's yeah. the way that we'll we'll beat get this back thing. To normal. Beat this thing together. It's uh, do it do it for your community. Do it for the people you love. Uh, you know, if not for you, do it for others. Uh, speaking of doing for others, our good friend, Mr. John Blickman. Mr. John Blickman. He is uh, paying for the show, so you don't have to. He's a generous guy like that. He's always, always taking care of others and looking out. And a part of the way he looks out is by building and innovating great brewing equipment, whether you're, uh, you know, brewing with uh, uh, small scale or big scale, whether you got a big budget or small budget, uh, Blinkman engineering's got you covered from, from the Anvil brewing series to their pro brewing line, whatever you're looking for, uh, check out Blinkman engineering. Cause you'll find something that has been, uh, uh, created, uh, you know, with brewers in mind and with innovation in mind uh, from a great uh, engineering mind. So check them out, BlickmanEngineering.com. You can even send John Blickman a nice email telling him thank you for the show to feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. All right, we're speaking with uh, Greg Casey. Uh, he's, he's, you know, become a brewing historian about uh uh, you know, in, 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 in the last 14 years, he's been studying really, you know, kind of the history of American brewing, but that that's looped in a lot of, uh, you know, the influences from other countries. You know, one of the things that uh, a couple of years, I'm, you know, here in California, and a question has always come up on two, two different beers. One is um, uh, steam beer uh, from Anger Steam, and the other is uh, the Alaskan Amber from uh, uh, Alaskan mm-hmm. Brewing, and both of them come from uh, you know a ways back. And one of the things that uh, has come up on on steam beer, uh, you know, there was always this this question of um, oh, what was what was the source? And for me, I always thought well. You know, it's German brewers who were here who came here during, you know, the, the, the gold rush and wanted to make beer. And what did they do? They, you know, tried making with the, with the ingredients they had and the temperature control that they had. And I wondered if, 
you know, these lager brewers who were trying to make, you know, the traditional lager beer of Germany, they, you know, they said, well, you know, hey, you know, they brew alt beer in, you know, Dusseldorf, and this is how they do it. You know, they just go a little warmer and that's what they did. And it's essentially just kind of their melange of lager brewing with alt brewing kind of, you know, thrown in there. And that became steam beer. The same sort of thing for uh, the beers in, uh, in, in Alaska brewing, because that was around the same time. That was also, you know, a gold rush uh, type of thing. You know, the, the rush to the Klondike was a little later. But, uh, uh, you know, I imagine it was the same sort of situation where they're just like, well, we'll just brew an alt beer. You know, that's what we did in Germany. That's what works in Germany. <laughs> It'll work here. You know, it, perhaps it was that sort of thing, because I, I see a lot of similarities between alt beer and, uh, you know, the Alaskan amber and also in, in steam beer. That's what, true. What are your thoughts on those, John? Uh, or, I mean, uh, Greg, am I just uh, losing my mind wandering? No, you know, <laughs> I was thinking when you're talking about steam beer, I remember uh, one of the earlier references, and they, you know, you go back to 1800s and there's a lot of mention of steam beer in the trade journals in the United States and the German influence on that. And the frequent use of the word excited. <laughs> and they're referring to the beer, you know, in terms of, uh, <laughs> sorry, I was like, excited beer. Um, but, you know, it was definitely, uh, and I think you touched on the points of, um, you know, materials available, and particularly in terms of uh, temperature control and options available at that time. California 1840s was, you know, late 1840s was not the modern state it is today. Uh, and most beer to that point had been ready use beer, you know, it wasn't something that was lagered uh, and kept uh, that came mostly started on the East Coast. So I think, yeah, to your point on the depending on the part of the country, uh, the brewers, and again, these are all, uh, truly overwhelmingly German American in their heritage for the two examples that you gave, um, were brewing what they were accustomed to. You know, if they could, if they had the resources and the capabilities, technically, they probably would have been brewing lager like they were doing uh, in New York State and Pennsylvania um, back in 1840s and 50s and 60s with natural caves and, you know, refrigeration before the artificial refrigeration really took off in the 1870s. But um, yeah, they just, it wasn't something unfamiliar to them. That brings up, our- brings up a, a topic that has kind of tickled the back of my brain. Um, maybe help educate our audience. What is the what is the timeline, if you will, between the advent of lager beers and the advent of Pilsner? Because Pilsner came much later, right? Yeah, Pilsner. Yeah, Pilsner. Uh, you know that came. Pils check. You know, Pils named after the uh, place of origin. Uh, lagers per se, and mostly darker colored, all malt, darker colored malts, um, um, lagers have been around since, you know, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, um, unaware of the enrichment, if you will, of this lager yeast, this um, unique creature that was a, a hybrid of uh, an alcohol tolerant yeast, cerevisiae, with a, a yeast that we now know uh, is, is a trace to trees in alpine environments, uh, Eubionis. Uh, when I was at Carlsberg, we didn't quite understand yet what was fully going on in the 80s, but now we have a pretty good picture. And that came from the wood and that got together. Wood was the ubiquitous material. And so loggers to your pre-Pilsners, most loggers from 1500s uh, right up to 1860s, 1870s was uh, amber color, kind of like an Alaska uh, amber, I guess, and the Dunkel style of beer. And then Pilsner exploded because of its... Um, um, unique properties of being pale, being brilliant, the champagne of beers. I mean, it was, uh, and it was easier, it was easier to drink. They were using rice in those parts of uh, Czech Republic as well at the time. They were balling before he passed. He was even brewing lager with potatoes, uh, for example, he published on that. Um, But yeah, so that this style of beer um, really uh, became, it's more highly carbonated, more hopped, it uh, wasn't as sweet, you know, all these attributes we associated um, hit, a, hit a, um, a nerve and a good one with consumers uh, in Europe and here. And uh, particularly here, um, can I do a self-serving 
um, act, which is both literal and sure. metaphorical. Sure. sure. All right. It's been sitting here. Got a glass that I bought at Carlsberg in 1985. These have both been sitting on ice. Um, it's blue, right? And you know, um, I, the guy that developed this, Ray Toms, by the way, it's a factioning guy at Coors, one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet in the industry. Um, but what made this was being in a glass. I was going to ask if, you know, the, the availability of clear drinking vessels, you know, that made a, made a huge yeah. difference. Yeah, that was enormous. I mean, that simple property of, and we talked about this in the first hour uh, previously, you know, that it, Americans like beer colder than the average bear. Uh, a German um, Bilsner of uh, the 1870s and 80s, um, when it was chilled down, particularly after transport across the Atlantic, was nowhere like this. You had American uh, brewers uh, beginning in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, right up until First World War and Prohibition. The only place in the world where you could get a beer that was this clear when it was ice cold was the United States of America. Not just fresh out of the brewery, but they were amazed when they came over for the, um, the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Uh, they came over in 1911 en masse for brewing expositions in Chicago as well. But they traveled to the United States and they were always, and they write this, Delbruck, you know, Max Delbruck, Delbruckia, the lactobacillus, uh, Vintage himself. Many German um, authorities were astonished to be able to get a beer and say that the heat of Arizona when it was chilled on ice, and it was still ice clear. It was crystal clear. And they flat out said there is no beer in Europe, even those for export that could accomplish that. So, you know, my self-serving demonstration is for that, but that's the metaphor, but also I'm getting thirsty. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating reading some of your articles. I mean, how many German brewers came over from Europe, and I shouldn't say just German brewers, but other European brewers came mm -hmm. over to learn in the United States, both in New York and Chicago. While chastising us for not paying enough attention. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, Wilhelm Vindich, the founder of VLB, for example, uh, he came over here as the personal envoy of the Kaiser. That's pretty heady stuff, right? 1912. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was interviewed. He came over here and he was interviewed by, he arrived in New York. You can see from the My Ancestry uh, or My Heritage and Ancestry.com, he came with his wife and he was in New York City and made his way up to Boston where the meeting was. But when he was there, he was interviewed by a reporter. This is 1912. So remember that first hour? Uh, things were really culminating. Would we have an American Ryan High School vote or not? And the lawyer saved us from, or not, the not. But he was asked by this reporter representing the media, who overwhelmingly wanted an American Ryan High School vote, asked this uh, distinguished German visitor, head of North, you know, the VLB, which like Von Steffen were gods then as they are today in terms of research centered and deservedly so, uh, his opinion. Uh, why, you know, shouldn't America join Germany? And it's, it's a riot to read. He, he ripped the strip off this reporter. Uh, he's, and he was literally down the street from the Reichstag when it passed June 3rd, 1906. Uh, he said, no, the, you know, the, 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 the law banning the use of malt substitute was passed for, uh, for special interests. And he specifically names the, the barley growers and barley farmers of Germany, a special interest. And he was very critical of it, limiting their ability to make a diverse style of beer, his words, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah, but we know with hops and malt and color and, you know, and different varieties, hops, aroma hops and bettering hops, you can make a countless combinations of beers, all malt beers in Germany, but uh, that's still, you know, in itself restricted. Uh, we talked about earlier in terms of, well, what do you get with fruits? What do you get, you know, which used to be very popular, you know, Belgian sours were almost like ubiquitous in Northern Germany for much of its history as well. So, but he, you know, here's this uh, German authority saying no um he, he 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 didn't like that and he wasn't he wasn't in support of it um i can expand a little bit on why it did pass if you like well let's let's do this let's take a short break and when we come back we'll have you do that right after this all right we're back we're talking with uh, greg casey uh about uh you know the history of uh, american uh bloggers and and also uh, you know, before we end this hour, I want to hear about some of the innovations American brewers brought to, brought to the table. So uh, before the break, uh, you were saying. 
Yeah, you know, in terms of um, the use, the history of the passage of the, uh, it's important to keep in mind, I didn't appreciate this when I started. I always assumed Ryan High School was Ryan High School, right? It was all Germany. That was kind of my, my paradigm that Bavaria was Germany. Um, but it's really, 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 really essential to keep in mind that there are two Rhine High School votes, the 1516, the Bavarian, but Germany didn't pass theirs until June 3rd, 1906, hmm. um, where they, they joined Bavaria in uh, banning the use of malt substitutes. And when you read the, uh, the transcripts of uh, Reich, uh, Reichstag hearings, there were many, many times in the 1890s where Northern German Brewer Association, many of them were petitioning the Reichstag to, to join Bavaria. That they, you know, like the seal of quality today, they perceived that if Northern German brewers who were, you know, mostly top fermented beers and even sours and things like that, they didn't have a heritage of lagers in Northern Germany. And they were building that with their breweries in the 1870s, 1890s, right up to 1906. They frequently petitioned uh, the Reichstag brewing organizations to join Bavaria. But what I read is the finance ministers of the Reichstag say, we will do that. If you agree to a, you know, the politicians for these regions agree to a pronounced increase in the malt tax, you know, if you want that, we want this. You yeah. know, again, the Beer Creek Follow the Money, John Bryce, um, and that, and these are not my words. These are, you know, in in transcripts where the um, folks are saying that was sort of the quid pro quo of the equation, and not until 1906, when if you think about what was going on in the world, and I say this did not happen in a vacuum. Why on June 3rd, 1906, did Germany join Bavaria? Well, you think of World War I, uh, just on the horizon. And um, they're flat out saying in the uh, Reichstag and in the newspapers, they need increased taxation to be able to build a Navy, particularly. They had a, the Prussians had a land force second to none already. But in terms of a Navy on a global, in a global war, um, where 1906 was when the imperial financial reforms came in. And you got this this mega increase in, in the malt tax rate compared to where it had been when Germany became the German Empire in 1872. And uh, for taxation revenue, along with cigarettes and inheritance taxes, and duty stamps, everything. There's, on the same day, June 3rd, 1906, uh, they were a package. So um, I think it's telling, and it goes back, you know, we mentioned earlier in the first hour uh, that they started, they included rice and other adjuncts in the tax code because they were being used, and, but not taxed. They can't tax something that doesn't fit in the tax code. So they stuck it in there outside of Bavaria for all of Germany, malt, rice, uh, potato starch was used ubiquitously, potato-based uh, syrups were used. Uh, the sugars and syrups were all part of the tax code because they were being used prior to 1872 to brew beer, but not being taxed. They only taxed malt, right? Like Bavaria, that was, in that way they were similar. But then by 1906, when they got rid of all these other categories, with the exception of sugars, uh, which, which quadrupled in use after 1906, because that was a industry in Germany that was particularly strong as well. Um, so it's a fascinating, you know, the intertwining within, even within Germany's history of the use of extracts, or pardon me, of, of adjuncts. And it was, you know, they wasn't used nearly to the extent the United States, and as I mentioned, brewers organizations in the North were in support of uh, joining Bavaria, but as a style, the people were saying, you know, just based on the statistics, somebody was drinking that beer. Yeah, it, it really does kind of blow the, the myth of purity and uh, so on out of the water. Um, all of these laws uh, have always, it seemed to always have been about money, you know, and governments needing to raise money and where do we get it? Well, people drink beer and other spirits and well, I make that tax. point in, in the paper in that, you know, it will never, we mentioned the first time, we'll never agree why it was passed in 1516. But 1903, uh, June 3rd, 1906, my grandfather was alive. Uh, you know, that's a little bit more contemporary to me. And uh, to me, you know, I mentioned the fact, if you look, what were the motivations of the Kaiser versus the uh, the Duke, the Wittelbach dynasty of royalty in Bavaria, I think in terms of the motivation of one, you can kind of, you might have an answer uh, with a higher power being the Kaiser. And it, that part 1906 is very, very clear. Uh, and it even got uh, strengthened uh, in terms of taxation uh, during the first world war, for example, in Germany, embargoes, uh, they weren't brewing beer. They were brewing something that had like a fraction of you know, malt dust and, 
you know, it was called Earth's Foss. It was a beer. But if you got a taxation system based on malt and you're not using much malt, 1918, and this isn't commonly known, Germany reverted to taxing on beer produced. And they taxed the beer, which was a fraction of what beer really was, and got even as much money as they did pre-war by taxing this soup, if you will, this watery matrix. They had money, you know, 1918, July, getting ready for that last push. The Americans had entered, it was like now or never kind of thing. Um, and then it got even more interesting from February 5th, 1921 to September 30th, 1924, uh, American style adjunct lager beer was being brewed, but it was being brewed in Germany. Uh, this is when American prohibition was on, right? Those dates, yeah. 1920s, the whole decade was prohibition. Uh, the Weimar Republic, if uh, I'm old enough to remember black and white videos of wheelbarrows of money and Reichsmarks paying for a loaf of bread, you know? Uh, inflation was rampant. They were paying off their debt for prepping for the war and then reparations. And uh, Germany, German brewers were allowed once again to use corn rice. And once again, they did a great job of keeping statistics. And once again, you know, you see 10, 15, 20% extra on a national level in, the, in, in, in Germany, outside of Bavaria, outside mm -hmm. of Bavaria, but uh, in Germany. So they were, it was only, they were well accustomed to to brewing, um, you know, with adjuncts up to 1906 in much of Germany. It was just going back to what they'd been doing only, you know, a scant 15 years later. And they did that for three and a half years. Um, and, you know, and they were taxing the, keep in mind again, they were taxing not the materials, uh, but they were taxing on the beer brewed. And yeah. they wanted more beer brewed and you get the gist. Whether people agree with my assessment, uh, that's obviously the beauty of the argument. But uh, as a fan, of hit, as a student of history, I think, uh, it, particularly in the case of um, contemporary, the second Rheinheitsko boat and all these unique periods, none of them happened in a vacuum. They were all driven um, by the circumstances of the time. And from the consistent beneficiary is the Reichstag treasury in all these scenarios. That I check for bombs every morning when I go out for my morning <laughs> paper to snap the German papers out. But yes, yeah, I have very good friends in Germany. I've been blessed to have a long career and you know, I've got some very good friends and I've talked to them openly about this and asked them, are you aware of this history? And uh, when you get you know, directors of some pretty big brewing institutions in Germany saying, news to me, you know, kind of like it was to Bill Coors about 1890 that um, you know, we always had an American Ryan High School boat. Um, history, uh, it can be soon forgotten. And when you think particularly of what took place in this last 100, 150 years with wars, two global wars, depressions, and you name it, um, Wall Street, I mean, there's so many events that it's easy to forget what took place uh, back in the context of these times. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's, yeah, in, in, a, in an ironic kind of way, you know, because I look at who protected our rights, you know, I look at heretics in the background there, I imagine there must be something that isn't just small tops, water and yeast. And John, you know, they haven't just that you've at one point you're here you something else. The, the to me, the that generation of German Americans, the 1870s, right up to um, First World War, when they fought hard to protect the right, they fought for themselves, obviously, but they've also have defended the rights of us today. Um, to be the beneficiary of, of not being handicapped to brew the beer of, you know, Jamila, your point of what beer do you like? If it's got exotic fruits or whatever, I don't care. If you like it, you like it. Uh, but the freedom, the professional freedom to do that was protected by these German American immigrants that fought the powers that be right up to and including the Supreme Court in the United States um, to preserve the right of an American brewer, suspend it during prohibition. But in a way, I mean, they've, you know, they're part of their legacy is the craft movement today. And part of their legacy, I believe, is the fact that they're enabling young German craft brewers today, you know, in Germany to explore their own heritage, to explore the world of beer um, beyond the Reinheit mm -hmm. And And um, yeah, that's an uphill battle culturally, maybe not legally, but culturally and practically. But you see more and more examples of young German craft brewers you know, exploring the pushing the boundaries to, you know, to follow the influence of another American revolution, the craft, just like the 
you know, the first revolution with the adjunct Pilsner, you know, I can get, well, I get an adjunct Pilsner in Tokyo when I visit my son, or when I lecture in China, I can get, you know, snow, it's an adjunct, it tastes like Miller High Life. I mean, that's their legacy too. So I, I kind of, maybe it's a stretch to say, but I get kind of a little sentimental about the fact that their legacy, because they came for freedom, that's hmm. very clear. You know, Germany was not a place to be in the 1840s, 50s, whatever, if you believed in liberal democracy. It wasn't. These guys lived personal freedom. They knew what personal liberty meant, and they exercised it. I mean, they're great examples to me as a naturalized citizen of what it's like to be an engaged citizen in a republic, not to hesitate to state, this is what I believe. And they did that, and they won. And um, so I see in them a young German brewer in Munich today who's do, using something other than malt hops, water, and yeast, um, that's part of their legacy too, you know, that we didn't join the world. That's fascinating. And, and it's an interesting take that I hadn't heard before that, uh, you know, the, the connection between fighting to, for the ability to put adjuncts in lagers to the, the freedoms that we still have today to, to brew, you know, whatever, whatever we want. Uh, yeah, we make a beer that, uh, and I, I put on it, um, you know, we call it a fourth of juicy. I'm like, you know, in a lot of countries, you can't, you can't brew this beer because, you know, either because of taxes or other restrictions that are put on brewing and you're not allowed to do that, that stuff. And, uh, yet here in, in the United States, you can pretty much do whatever you want. I mean, the TTB has some, <laughs> some stuff that they, they poo poo, but, um, you know, you're, you're pretty much free to, to, you know, to brew anything you can think of in the United States. And, and it's really cool that, you know, this came from, you know, that's, it's, it's our history and people actually fought for that. And, yeah. Uh, I, I think, think people, everybody likes a fighter, right? Everybody likes a good story. I mean, going up against, you know, you know, testifying in front of future presidents, you know, this is a subject is, is adjuncts and malt substitutes seems to me to be surreal. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of it, but you know, yes, their context was to use corn and rice based products. They wasn't to use the materials you just mentioned, Jamil, or you know, every drop of beer my son brews in Glenwood Springs would be illegal. He's got wheat, he's got fruit from the Western slope, you know, it, it would be illegal. And in, night, in that time, and this touches John, you're earlier about the pure food movement. Yeah. The pure food movement wasn't just an American thing. It was a global phenom. You know, that pure food adulteration of the food oh. supply was something that, and in that window of time between 1899, when the Brits really, the British, you know, whether the arsenic had gotten to their lip yet, <laughs> first hour, you got to listen if, uh, go back to that podcast. Uh, but, you know, 1899, the, they, they did the most exhaustive examination, should they have effectively a British Ryan Heights vote, and uh, they overwhelmingly ruled against it to allow, you know, uh, what was the expression? And this is lovely to put more sun in the mash tun. You know what I mean? <laughs> put more sun to get a plumper. You know, the British barley and malts were kind of like, you know, it's not the best growing area. They were high in protein. And, you know, they, they just, you know, to dilute that with plump, you couldn't get a plump barley grown in, in Britain, but you could put more sun in the mash tun by using adjuncts. Isn't that a beautiful expression? Yeah. <laughs> these are some of these moments of 14 years. I go, God, I wish I thought of that. Um, <laughs> put more sun in the mash tun. But anyway, they looked at it in England. They decided to, you know, democracy. I, I think, yeah, in theory, Germany in 1906 was a democracy, but, uh, you know, the, the Kaiser was absolute. I mean, he was an emperor. Uh, they had a democracy, but, um, you know, I think it, it's very telling that it, in the United States, well, within 10 years, Great Britain, United States, Germany, all looked at national bans on malt substitutes, and only Germany did it. Um, whereas in the democracies, um, there was very aggressive testimony by the industry saying, no, we shouldn't do it. This is why. Uh, I think you were going to ask earlier about innovations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's do this. Let's take a short break. When we come back, I want to ask you about uh, some of the brewing innovations in America uh, over over the, the last uh, you know century or so. Uh, we'll take a short break. We'll be back right after this.
All right, we're back. I want to tell you about uh, our good friends, uh, RJ and Josh up at Brew Chatter, Sparks, Nevada, right outside of Reno. If you're up that way, stop on by. They've got a cool little bar in there. They got all the brewing gear, everything you're going to need to uh, have a great brew day. They've got, they can, they can teach you to start or they can help improve what you're doing through their, through their extensive knowledge and abilities. All right. Uh, yeah, great. Before the break, I was uh, asking about uh, the American brewing innovations. You, you've come across a number of them in your in your research over the last fourteen years about uh, you know brewing history. What's what's some of the, the the odd ones that we may not have heard of, or, or ones that had a big impact, uh, you know, uh, out there? Yeah, uh, I think looking, and this is uh, one that I'd never heard of prior to being on research, but you know, when you look at that, that clear beer, obviously there could be physical instability, chill haze, which is not biological, or the beer could come turbid from you know, bacterial growth, right? Lactic acid bacteria or other wild yeast. Um, but one of the major earliest innovations, and this was like two decades, three decades before it took off in Europe, was uh, enclosed counter pressure, steel, glass lined enamel, fermenters and aging and finishing tanks. Um, as, as early as the 1880s, I think we think of today, um, um, Leopold Nathan, um, a, Germ a Swiss with a German, um, right around the time of the First World War, developed a patent for what the, you know, the modern, we view as the modern conical uh, fermenter. But um, these, a uh, guy by the name of Casper Fodler, he was a German immigrant, he was three, uh, when he arrived in New York City um, in March with his parents, uh, 1864, um, fast forward, he 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 went. He, his father was a brewer uh, in Rochester. He became a brewer in Rochester as well uh, at the um, oh, I can't remember the name of the brewery. That's a large brewery in, in Rochester. But he worked there. But then he was also a machinist as well, and he developed a patent on the Faldler uh, vacuum fermentation system process. Uh, and it was, when you see these tanks, they're clearly, you go into, you know, they're very, very, very clearly the modern type of tank design um, with counter pressure steel. And um, this was something that, you know, from a hygiene up to that point, everything had been open. The fermenters had been open, wood, um, you know, the aging casts were open to allow the residual to go, but it was kind of a biological nightmare. It was more or less a crapshoot from biological would uh, with that the likelihood of that happening well the the glass line steel and then the tanks with a curved bottom you know made cleaning a dream uh in comparison the exposure and when you look at um the explosion globally of this technology to operate breweries uh lager breweries specifically under counter pressure uh Fodler had systems uh in literally every continent except antarctica uh, in you know in, in Munich, uh, one of his first ones, which I find kind of touching, was in Barmen, which is the town in Germany where Adolphus Kors was born. Uh, that was the first one in Germany. But there were numerous examples of German brewers adopting the Fodler technology um, for lager brewing. Um, Sweden, Poland, Finland, uh, Alsops in in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, you have these wonderful because the photography was just take you know it's early widespread use, you got these massive pictures of these trains with these conical fermenters, steel fermenters, you know, back, you know, 70, 80 cars long uh, being shipped from their manufacturer in Detroit uh, and shipped around the world. And in the Alsop one, 1899, I believe, or 1900, right around there, um, you know, they were filming it and showing it at movie theaters in Great Britain to audiences, the marvel of these massive vessels that were going to be used to brew the first all, you know, Alsap's first lager brewery. Uh, so it really, really, you know, it started, you know, obviously these 150 years now, uh, the modern, you know, there's been innovations and design changes and, and further improvements, but fundamentally part of our heritage, American brewing heritage uh, is that. And I'm struck, you know, when I go on the website of Fodler, because it's still a company today, I think it's corporate and in, in headquarters there, but it says the German Casper uh, Fodler developed this. Now, well, not German American, not, you know, he was three when he came here. His wife was American. She was born in Buffalo. 
He says in all his patents, I, Casper Fodler, a citizen of the United States, is his, you know, in his first, um, all of his patents, he's described himself as a citizen. And it is be buried in Buffalo to date. Everything's in English. And she put my husband, you know. So to me, I identify this guy as being an American. He was German American, but yeah, he, he was a Yank. Um, and so many American innovations came from, you, you just hear this from German authorities and Horace Brown and other, you know, British authorities. There's one thing about Americans, they're fearless, you know, and they're impatient. <laughs> And um, they, you know, they're not adherent to old world customs, norms, habits there. And, and you look at um, the packaging front, the modern packaging um, hall is, is, is purely American, you know, in terms of bottles and, you know, bottled beer and things of that nature. Uh, again, all of which helped in the hygiene, uh, chill proofers, chill, Wallerstein, you know, chill proofing um, materials, uh, enzymes and uh, papayan and, you know, things of that nature. Um, all, all geared to deliver that. Mm. You know, yeah, if you're if you're curious as to this uh, Fodler uh, brew tanks, uh, there is some some other uh, some pictures of it on uh, uh, Ron Pattinson's uh, blog. Oh. He's got the Allsop's uh, brewery photos on there. And so. Gary um, in Toronto, he's. Uh, how do you, is it beer to, how do you pronounce his webpage? Beer, 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 T -E. he's a, he's a, a Canadian uh, historian, brewing historian, and I've seen him writing on it as well. Mm -hmm. And I've been in contact with him recently as a result of some of these papers. So fascinating, but yeah, it's, it's really not widely under, uh, understood. You know, there's mm -hmm. really uh, with the war, first world war coming in. I mean, they built the father built a, uh, manufacturing site in northern germany in 1908 um obviously not a good investment with world war one and all that yeah. so you know prohibition um really did a lot more than just um put a, a damper on beer production of course but it you know on the allied industries all the all the the brewing schools i mean they disappeared um you know and before the first world war heineken and uh, the owners of uh, heineken and and uh, Carlsberg sent their sons to Chicago to learn to brew. They didn't send them to uh, Weinstephan. They didn't send them to uh, Berlin. They sent them over here to brew American beer. Jakobsen called his uh, brew house, his new brew house, uh, his American brew house. And um, he had, and used, they were using corn because a Medal of Honor winner from the Civil War, they first they got it from Abraham Lincoln. I'm di diverging here, but the history is fascinating. Um, Carlsberg and uh, Heineken, their use of corn started with a push in the 1880s uh, with the Department of Agriculture in the United States to get as an export product. Concurrently with the same time in the United States, they're trying to ban it, right? Imagine the government <laughs> doing something like this, one, yeah. one branch versus the other. But um, anyhow, it's, uh, these, uh, these innovations um, were unique to America uh, at the time. Uh, their, their legacy is still there, but not recognized. And you know, when I read, particularly uh, uh, or hear of conversations uh, with within my industry, the macro, but even in craft, well, America, we have no history. We have no brewing history. Germans have history. The Belgians have history. The English have history. And uh, I, you know, one of the most ironic fire pit conversations in my backyard was by uh, a very high-ranking official at, at Dumans. Um, here for a craft brewers association meeting, say, how can you say you have no history? You know, we, he said, we just did a survey of germ, of world beer consumption and your beer, adjunct lager beer, is, is the dominant beer in the world. You know, it, it may have got a start, as we talked in the first hour uh, in Germany, but it really got developed uh, here and perfected and acknowledged as being perfected uh, in a way that they knew they couldn't do. And I mentioned that uh, when, when the Vintage had that interview with the group, when he finally got to give his keynote address in Boston, he chastised the American brewers industry for not paying enough attention to what was going on in Germany because uh, they were busy perfecting a style of beer that, uh, in a, you know, after saying, we have been your students, the head of VLB referring to the American brewing industry in 1912, we have been your students. So all these innovations, amazing yeah. packaging, not just, you know, the whole supply chain, you know, the whole supply chain. Hmm. That's fascinating. All right, uh, let's take uh, one more short break 
And when we come back, we will uh, wrap up with uh, Greg right after this. All right, we're back. Uh, any questions in the chat, John? Or uh... Yeah, there's uh, one more. Um, basically, why can't the USA make Meritson all year long? Um, <laughs> they could. I, I, think if, I think we do. <laughs> Maybe That's not uh, institutionally, but... Uh... Yeah, we can't. I mean, there's nothing technically preventing that. Yeah. For sure. And if American right. consumers said that's the only beer we wanted, that's probably the right. only beer that would be uh, yeah. brewed, right? Yeah. Well, it kind of touches on refrigeration, you know, and and temperature con fermentation, temperature control. Right. Right. And all those are givens now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Meritson, you know, grew as a style because it could only be brewed. Um, I think, wasn't it, I believe you said that, um, or someone said that um, beer could only be brewed through from fall to spring. Yeah, September to you know, St. Michaela, some religious holidays buffered it because the absolute need for cold. Yeah, yeah. It, and that's, a you know, there's an interesting, uh, there's there was a Discovery Channel not too long ago called How Beer Saved the World. Did you guys ever... Does that ring a bell? I heard of it. I, I yeah. did not see it. It's really good. It's got Charlie on it. It's got uh, other uh, noticeable uh, figures. But it, at one point, and it's not Charlie or any of the others, but the broadcaster, the narrator yeah. says, lager beer, uh, the taps, you know, how they refrigeration was essential for uh, lager beer production. The taps went dry in the summer and they'd missed the entire point because that's when lager was a seasonal beer like Matson and others, it was a summer beer. You know, I, we think of, mm -hmm. um, you know, wheat beer, the Weizen as a spring beer, but lager um, really in 19, 1860s and 70s and particularly in that window time, because by 1880s, our, you know, refrigeration systems were in place. They relied strictly on mother nature and hauling chunks of ice and whatever. So they brewed during those months, the traditional, but the beer was served in the summer. It was a refreshing beer. Uh, it was limited supply. There were lager riots in New York City. You read the New York Times when they ran out of lager beer because uh, they could, you know, they didn't have the technical capability of making it a year-round product. And ironically, New Orleans, I think, is the first brewery. The brewery there was the first ever artificial refrigeration system in the United States because New Orleans didn't have any ice by the time it got down there by barge water and melted. I mean, you know, there was a need for it. But it's important to remember that lager was a seasonal beer. Uh, not just in Germany, but, you know, here as well, um, yeah. but, you know, and, and it really it exploded refrigeration made it possible not to make it a seasonal beer because the taps came on and they would pack it in ice. You know, they would deliver it to the saloons on ice to keep it cold. You know, the ice that they'd harvested and kept in there, you know, these really, really insulated areas in the caves and grounds uh, to be able to en encompass the cask in that ice to deliver it. And it was a big deal to be there when that cask was, you know, after it had been excited by poisoning, excited um, <laughs> to be able to have a refreshing lager beer on a hot day. That was part of our heritage I never really thought of either, you know, that it was a seasonal beer um, hmm. for quite some time. One of my, my favorite things is, you know, some of the historic ways of making beer, not, not necessarily that it was better, but you know, you just, you find a fascination with it. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to make, a, you know, a, you know, like a cool ship for, for doing some beers. I want to do, you know, a double drop for doing uh, you know, some British beers. I want to, I want a Yorkshire Square, instead yeah. of Burton Union. I want, I want to do all these things. And people are like, well, why? You know, it's, I, you know, just, just because, just because, you know, I want to feel that connection with, you know, the brewers of the past. I want to see how mm -hmm. that changes the beer. Because fermentation, you and I know that fermentation is so critical to, to beer. And, and, you know, in my opinion, it's, you know, 95% of the flavor of beer is from fermentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you change fermentation in small ways, it has a major impact on beer. But uh, so what, what, you know, uh, other than the, uh, the glass line tanks, which was, you know, a, you know, a modern, uh, you know, a, a start of the modern, you know, unitank, 
uh, were there other, you know, from yeah, the, I mean, the entire, you know, the, the, the double mash system, for example, you know, double mash is uniquely American. Uh, and it was, is that a, does that mean like a serial mash, double mash? Is that what you're speaking of? I mean, two, I mean, a, a main mash vessel and a mash done with a, uh, a, a, a corn or whatever your adjunct corn basis boiler. was mixed with malt. So it wasn't like a decoction taking it and boiling it. It was mashing with you know with certain amount of malt and the adjunct to get um, you know better conversion um, of the mm -hmm. adjunct and then joining the two mashes as one to complete the process. Mm -hmm. England was infusion, Germany was decoction, depending how many times they is a dick mash or I'm not an expert, but you know, in terms of one or two, you know, boils, even three in some cases, depending on the mm -hmm. style and what you're trying to accomplish from body and flavor. But yeah, the double mash system, you know, in terms of as an American innovation that was, I believe, evolved because of the extensive use, particularly at the 30, what you, what you start getting up to 30, 40% mm -hmm. of the grist bill being adjunct, um, you know, you got to do it, you got to do a pretty thorough job of being able to get the conversion of that adjunct uh, to be a cost, cost effective, but also to deliver what you're trying to do in the style of beer. So I think that was um, a big one when that uh, Ludwig Kaka came over in 1860s. Uh, he was he was he, he was based on the German style, you know, a raw corn paste, uh, mix some, add add some malt and boil the crap out of it, kind of thing. Oh, okay. uh, but uh, the double mash, uh, gentler, if you will, uh, maybe in terms of um, the chemistry or the biochemistry not being appreciated at the time, but what that did. In terms of the materials that eventually could potentially become chill haze, uh, you know that wasn't their reason for doing it, but they got better results if they did it. So mm -hmm. you know things are learned before they're implemented and institutionalized, and the science quite often catches up later. So I think that was another another big the brew house uh, you know program regimen. Um, and by the time 1900 1901 uh, Wallerstein, um, you know that the, the development of chill proof. Um, enzymes, you know, mm -hmm. as an aid to supplement these other, you know, which which barley variety to use two versus six row, um, germ, you know, decoction versus uh, double mash. Um, these just gave another silver bullet, if you will, of protection um, to assure that beer did not um, develop haze with time. So cumulatively, you know, it started with as simple as the use of adjuncts, but then these other innovations. You know, including the fodler, including the double mash, including chill, chill proof uh, agents, um, it was a big deal, and it's really remarkable to see in newspaper um, ads for breweries of um, brewers letting their consumers know specifically the term chill proof. Can you imagine today? You know, a chill proof beer, chill proof, chill, and big uh, letters, chill proof beer, and they show images of their brand on a block of ice, and it's clear. It was a big deal to the consumer. Um, so this, but again, it comes back to the American idiosyncrasies of liking cold, you know, drinking colder beverages than the average bear still to this day, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I, I've got a local buff, you know, uh, I'll leave it unnamed, but in Castle Rock, uh, Colorado, I had their lager and it was like, it was too warm. And I called, you know, I called my owner, I said, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and she came and probably brought the brewer. The brewer said, well, we serve at the German serving temperature. I said, I don't speak in the Deutsch. I just said, you may want to consider, you know, and I understand where he's come from, right? He was, you know, generally to your point, the history and honoring the traditions. And he was serving it as, a, you know, it was criminal to serve it too cold in Germany. Criminal. I mean, they had, you know, thermometers and they were pretty serious about it in the 1800s and before the First World War. Uh, but, you know, I, I went, oh, I like my beer cold. But anyhow. These <laughs> and see, my, my thing on that is, it's like, look, if you serve it to me too cold, I can always warm it up. And I have that ability, but I can't chill it back down. No, exactly. So give it to me a little colder, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll wait a moment until it's warm and, to my to my. And life. I get the science with it's warmer. You smell, you know. I get that. I get that. Even when I was in Anheuser Busch, I you know these they the the Germans in the old schoolhouse, you know. And, and trust me, it was a German trained senior leadership when I was there in the 1980s. They wouldn't drink it cold. You know, they didn't drink their bud cold. They preferred to have it warmer. And uh, they would um, sort of privately say, this is how you really should drink the beer. And I'm like, well, 
I don't know, my Irish Canadian father liked it. My grandfather liked it ice cold, and I like it ice cold too. But you're right, you can't you can't go the other way. But you right, can't. right. Well, and, and you know, like we we talked before, you know, uh, whatever beer you enjoy, I, I always say, you know, uh, you you can't tell somebody you know who they love. You know, you, whoever you love, you're you're correct. You're 100 yes. correct, and nobody can tell it's you. Good analogy. Wrong. Yeah. Some people may tell you you're wrong, but it's the same thing on beer. <laughs> Good analogy. You, Your you parents beer you love, you're right. That is that is the beer you love. That's the best beer possible. That's your taste buds. Go it's, for it. I remember he said Anton Schwartz said in 1890 in the testimony in the Senate hearings, the gustibus non est disputatum. Taste is not in dispute. It's personal. You know whether it's in your beer or your spouse. You're stuck with your children. Some days are better than others. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole other. <laughs> oh, this is live, isn't it? Oh, I'll pay for that. Um, but yeah, I, I love. <laughs> I love that analogy in terms of your stuff. I mean, you, who, who you fall in love with is is personal. Yeah, it's none of our business. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you know, uh, love the beer you love. Yeah, love should not be prescribed, and beer should not be prescribed. Yeah. Should be left to the discovery. To explore the possibilities yeah. and just like in human relationships the diversity on the planet such as the diversity of beers that are free to explore and find what works for you and um by no means don't drink one style you know i, I right. read people when i talk to people i only drink this i'm like eh, you should try, yeah, I mean, try, it's try it's some better i'm not saying it's better but you know right. you should, it's, it's different enjoy yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's like travel and everything else, you know, opens, opens you up and it may just make you appreciate the beer that you, you drank all the time as well. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's what I'm hoping in a part, you know, the, the awareness, because I think as American brewers, um, we've, we've, um, we've given the wine industry and the distilling industry, the, the, the right to say they have history, they have traditions, that these are American traditions, right? And I think uh, American brewing uh, doesn't have that panache or that- um, We've, you know, yeah, you we know, need to claim, know. reclaim that. Yeah, we need to reclaim that. And I think if we do, I think I got too enamored with the, yeah, this many generations of one style of beer. I pity my father and grandfather because that's, and you know, the same thing in America, you know, that, that's, there's one beer, right? It was an mm -hmm. adjunct lager beer for several generations. And that's pretty, Charlie Papazing was right. That's boring, you know, um, you, you should have a, a diversity. So I, you know, I, I think it's, um, it's wonderful that we do have it. Um, things are an acquired taste, even my son's beer. He's, I know this is live, but I really didn't particularly care for farmhouse ales when I first had them. Um, back in 2014, when he brewed it, and I was, yeah, okay, Troy, this tastes okay, uh, but but now I'm an acquired taste, and I understand right. understanding right. to your point, Jamel and John, it's understanding the history and the traditions and the materials uh, that go into it. Um, I thought was pretty cool, and I now I look forward to it, you know, because I get them and I understand that the 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 biology as well as the agronomy uh, and the history of how they produce them. It goes in to put that little, you know, turbid, <laughs> not right, clear, right. Uh, in a glass, in a little sifter. So, yeah, the voyage well, discovery. And, and it's so cool the the point you you made out uh, about uh, you know the the fight to be able to include adjuncts in mm -hmm. American beer and not have you know the restrictions on it uh, really you know affords us the the ability to make all these different. Uh, uh, beers today with all the the weird adjuncts or uh great you know, points whatever whatever you want to add so yeah mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that that's the first time i really uh made that association so i uh, love that all right uh great show thank you very much uh greg uh, casey for uh your time uh, it was very enjoyable very interesting uh you know, information on, on, on the history of brewing and, and some of the things that, you know, we just never knew or, you know, took for granted. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't, you don't meet many geeks for adjunct lager beer. <laughs> right. Right. But now I think yeah, I've, I've got a, a better appreciation for, you know, the history and, and, you know, uh, what it's it means so, today. And, and, you know, it's so you know, little of it is the bushes and the millers and the cores. The vast majority of the history, I mean, in, in the papers and in the books, they're they're barely mentioned. 
this is an American story. This was, you know, you hear shipper versus local breweries is the reason the big shippers, the Paps, the Millers, and the Anheuser Bushes and the Schlitzes. And no, it, it was happening. It was ubiquitous everywhere from Montana to uh, you know Idaho to anywhere in the United States. Breweries long forgotten, but they all went to this trouble. To and I'm actually going to John. I'm talking to you about this, but. I'm going to have this spreadsheet of the hundreds, if not leading into thousands of documented proof of the integration of the ability to use adjuncts in their breweries. That it wasn't just, you know, a piece of a piece of history, American history, that shows how ubiquitous our beer, the adjunct, the you know, national beverage of the time, like the IPA might be the national beverage of craft, uh, how ubiquitous it was in the 1800s in the United States. And we've forgotten all that. And I think if we, you know, we thought of that, thought of that history, appreciate that history, you know, brewing, whether we're craft or macro, um, would be good for the industry. Um, and I think it would be, you know, a good, something to talk about in a positive light about the history of America beer, not just automatically to default to, well, it's just World War II and, you know, yeah. it was forced down there, effective marketing people forced these, innocent, you know, these gullible people that drink a beer they didn't really like. No, no, no. I tell you, if I could force people to drink my beer, I would. That's what you like. Come on. Oh, yeah. Cheers to that. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, if you uh, enjoy the show, make sure you reach out to our sponsors, uh, Blickman Engineering, uh, BlickmanEngineering.com. You can send an email to John Blickman at feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com uh, and tell them how much you enjoy the show. And uh, same thing for the, the, the kind folks at Brew Chatter. Uh, good, good couple of guys and a great, great uh, store that they've uh, created over there. So check them out, brewchatter.com. Till then, everybody, brew strong. Brew strong, everyone. Gesundheit.